Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 76. This episode is Nine Numb himself, Mike Quinn. That's right, guys. We got him. It finally happened. And uh, I'm excited to say he's just as awesome as you'd expect. We talk about uh, how he first got started in puppetry, where he learned his technique, and believe it or not, his first professional gig was on The Muppets. Oh, yeah. You heard that right. The Muppets. Okay. What's even crazier is his first three movies were uh, uh, The Great Muppet Caper and then Dark Crystal. Crazy. And then uh, just a little movie called uh, Star Wars Episode Six: Return of the Jedi. What? His first three movies out the gate were those movies. So it's, uh, it's no surprise that he would go on to have a, uh, a crazy long career and be a professional puppeteer for, oh, I don't know, 30 years. What? Craziness, craziness. And uh, as if it couldn't uh, get any crazier, he now has a, a book that he's trying to get funded on Kickstarter. Definitely check that out. It is called uh, Talk to the Hand by Mike Quinn, which is hilarious. As you guys know, I'm a pun enthusiast. And this, <laughs> actually, this chat is uh, full of puns because Mike is great. Um, but yeah, we talk about that. We talk about his different movies he's done. We talk about, uh, Nine Numb, uh, what part he played in the actual puppet, which was awesome. What it was like getting that call to come back for episode seven. And then, uh, there was a little point in there where Mike, uh, started, uh, dabbling in a little bit of animation and then became an animator, which is like digital puppetry, which is crazy. And he also, uh, he played a little part in, uh, in episode two. That's right. You heard me right, yeah. Nine Numb, Mike Quinn, did a little animation in episode two, which is crazy. Had no idea before this. But uh, yeah, chock full of stories. Uh, so check out his book, Talk to the Hand, by Mike Quinn, on Kickstarter. Also, if you'd like to learn the art of puppetry, Mike actually teaches uh, the uh, Secrets of Puppetry School, which is crazy awesome. I'm actually uh, a student there learning the art. Um, He's a great teacher, and the way that he breaks lessons down and teaches techniques is really, really digestible and uh, really cool. It's really, really cool. I'm, like, looking at my hand differently. I'm like, oh, it moves like that, and that's how how it becomes lifelike and how to hold your arm right, and it's just cool. It's cool, Uh, like Mike himself. So without further ado, let's get into it. Here is the interesting podcast, episode number 76 with Mike Quinn. Theme song time. That's good to hear. You know, you got your coffee, so that's good. I also drink coffee in yes, the middle I do. of the days because I work nights. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, how do I keep going? Bro? Yeah, I like I like a lot of coffee in small amounts. You know, that's how I how I usually do it. So that's sort of funny. like a, 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 a little slow sort of drip throughout the day. <laughs> yeah, just, just enough to keep it going. I hear you. I hear you. Yeah. But uh, the one thing, so I, I always like to ask people who do specifically puppetry because it's the best medium, in my opinion. Uh, yeah. Like, where does that sort of interest start? Do you remember if there was like a moment where you're like, oh, I, I need to do that? Yeah, it's really hard to pinpoint sort of that moment. Um, although there were sort of several events, I think, that sort of that sort of uh, took me there. It's, it's actually a really interesting question because it's sort of the roots of, of where everything starts, you know. Yeah. Um, certainly uh, uh, growing up in the in the 60s, uh, you know, uh, in, in, uh, in England as, as a little kid, We'd have things like um, Punch and Judy shows, which would be, you know, the live sort of glove puppet booth shows on places like the beach and, and thereabouts. So so that was sort of a part of the culture over there sure. as well. And also we had uh, a lot of TV, uh, old TV shows that they would rerun, old black and white films of marionettes and glove puppets and things like that that were made for preschoolers. Right. Um, so I'd, I'd watch those as well. Uh, and then I had some some little toy puppets too, sort of around that same kind of age. 
Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. So, no, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that it was a part um, of the culture as and, well. And so, yeah, absolutely. I'd make paper, uh, puppets out of like paper bags as well, and and it was just sort of a, a thing that was always around. Um, but then as I got a bit older, I sort of got more into um, a lot into cartoons and would draw draw cartoon characters and was very very big into Disney as a, as a as a small kid as well. So sure. that sort of excited me a lot. So so that was sort of um, more of a, um, a, a story and character based uh, uh, projects, you know, the, the cartoon characters. Mm-hmm. So when Muppet Show came along in 1976 and it, it hit big in the UK a little bit sooner than it did in the States um, in that first year, in fact, um, it was sort of like a combination of the two, basically. It was like, well, living cartoons, you know, they weren't just, oh, puppets anymore. You know, they were like living, breathing colorful cartoons so it sort of sort of hit hit both uh, notes with me it's like wow these are puppets but yet they're they're also like like animation you know yeah. so so that was that was kind of another defining moment i think once i'd seen the first couple of episodes i was sort of hooked and and obsessed from that point forward and that was it basically so it was a series of events and then i guess one big event <laughs> you know what i've never thought about it that way that puppets are living cartoons that's a genius way to look at it because you're right yeah yeah, at least that kind of puppetry. Certainly, the the you know the the sort of Muppet style TV the uh, puppet. It's real time. I mean, yeah, it's real time animation, basically. Wow! I, the, all this time, I've been a massive Muppet <laughs> fan, and I've never looked at it that way. That's good. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so the Muppets got you like really into it, and then correct me if I'm wrong. Like your first foray into the industry was working on the Muppets. It was, yeah, first. Proper. I, I did wow. a few things um, as a kid. Uh, you know, I had a live puppet show, a glove puppet show, and a, and a magic act. Um, oh, but I rarely got paid for that. Yeah, when I, from about eight years old upwards. Um, every once in a while, I'd, I'd get booked to, to do a kid's party or something like that. And, you know, I'd get paid a, a fee, I guess, as a kid to, to, to perform live. And I'd do a few auditions for TV, for the BBC and various things like that. But I didn't really get too far. So... So I, I was sort of doing it as a kid, but um, but yeah, I, my first professional gig really was um, for Jim Henson, yeah, in 1980. Wow. So so then, where did where did you learn puppetry? Then did you just figure it out as a kid and like grew your technique over time? It was sort of half and half. As um, once I got into uh, the Muppet Show in the late 70s, I sort of started to to try to make my own puppets and. Mm-hmm. And would practice a lot in front of the mirror and study their techniques. So I, I think I got like, um, you know, maybe half a. I got some of the basic uh, concepts down myself just by imitation um, and learning the different puppeteer styles and things like that. So, you know, when you're obsessed, it's a lot easier to get good at something or That's at least true. get better than many others. So, <clears throat> you know, it was a good it was a good thing. Okay. So I got I was able to get so far on my own. But of course, I didn't have the the uh, acting techniques and the vocal techniques and the monitor stuff and working, you know, on a set and in a scene and, and the, you know, those kind of, and with all these other different styles of puppets and kind of shapes and sizes of puppets. So that's something that you can really only, the, you can only learn that stuff really on the job, yeah. you know, in, in all reality, you can get, get your techniques down, but, um, but there are some things you just, you just have to, to do it the hard way on the job you know you can read as many books as you want and you can practice as much and that's great that will get you uh, a a good way but certainly back then in 1980 there was there was nowhere to learn this stuff to go because it was all still pretty new and 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 jim henson and his guys were still sort of pioneering this technique really at that at that time so um so so the rest i had to learn on the job and um uh, you know, make a few mistakes too along the way, uh, which is, you know, you have to make mistakes because that's how you learn. But Jim was very forgiving and he understood that. And he, I'm sure I've seen it, you know, a hundred times before. So he understood that. Sure. Um, you know, that was sort of the, w- w- one of the things that made him special is that he saw, he saw potential in people and gave them a chance. Uh, and, uh, he, yeah, he just sort of had that, that instinct, you know, um, yeah. And uh, more often than not, uh, the people he chose worked out, you know. So I just kind of, well, I never really auditioned. That's the funny thing. You really? know, it's, it's weird. 
Um, I was. I, I remember we were like um, at least probably halfway through the Great Muppet Caper, or, or a month or two into it, mm-hmm. and um, we were filming the uh, Mallory Gallery uh, sequence, oh, the baseball sweet. diamond sequence. And I was sitting off to the side of the set uh, waiting, and Frank Oz came by. And you know, I'd already been on the movie a month or two at least. I don't know. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I, I think at some point they thought, oh, we better see what this guy can actually do. You know, <laughs> focus on this. So I remember I had uh, he's you know he said here put scooter on so I put scooter on I was sitting in one of the chairs and he just sort of said you know okay look around look up here look down here look to the left look to the right um, follow my finger you know and he sort of moved his finger back and forth and and I'm you know to make sure I could follow his eye line and then I did some talking with him as well and and it was like you know thirty seconds he said great okay fine and off we went and yeah that was that'll it. do so. <laughs> So, uh, you know, I'd, I'd already shot a whole bunch of stuff, <laughs> but I guess he just wanted to see, OK, wh- where is this guy actually at? You know, because when you're, you're all filming on set, you're all worrying about your own stuff. Oh, yeah. I mean, Jim Jim was very good at, at looking at, around at the big picture, though. He was a good big picture guy, basically, and he could see, you know, if someone was doing something weird, you know, and then, then right. if they were, he'd move them to the back or something or <laughs> say, hey, do this instead or, you know, or tell them something. So. So, but, uh, you know, Frank, maybe so, but often, you know, Frank had so much to do with, with his, you know, fuzzy and piggy stuff. You know, he was very much a, a hard worker and, and, uh, and really precise. So I, I imagine Frank would generally tend to more focus on his own performances, whereas Jim would sort of just enjoy the whole scene and be looking around and seeing what's going on, you know. Sure. Um, so That's even so probably cool. during a take, I imagine he's not just looking at his frog or whatever. He's looking around at everything. Because he was also directing the movie as well at the same time. So. Right. Sheesh, the amount of brain <clears throat> yeah. power. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. But, you know, it was great. Everyone had such fun. It was it was an amazing time. And, you know, yeah, we're talking about learning, going back to your original question. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I was just, I don't know. I mean, it just worked out that I was in, oh, the, 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 it was the, it's still part of the magical sort of uh, Muppet era. So, you know, I... I I learned so much on the great Muppet caper. And then of course the dark crystal was back to back. So suddenly I got a grounding in that was pioneering as far as creatures and animatronics goes, which is like, was a whole different technique of puppetry, a whole different thing. Um, and it hadn't really been done before. So we were sort of learning that in, in workshops and, and rehearsals uh, situations and film tests. And then, and then of course, right after that was return of the Jedi. So I was already sort of set up to perform creatures and so, so Lucasfilm just basically said, "Oh yeah, you, we know Hanson, and you guys just did Dark Crystal. We'll we'll use you, kind of thing." So I never auditioned for Return of the Jedi either. Wow! Um, just hit the ground and running. So, so you know, those first three films in that those first um, three years basically uh, set me up uh, career-wise for life in in terms of of how how do you do this stuff? You know, I mean, yeah, of right. course, I've still you know, learned so much after that since then. Um, and, you know, I still am. I, I'm still learning, still still try, trying to improve and experiment and do different things and take take uh, things into into different areas. But but that was like the perfect, perfect storm for the perfect uh, groundwork. Yeah. Uh, for, for what I'm still using to this day, you know. Sure. Um, so it's a little bit harder for people to have that, the luxury that I had learning from the masters in that way. Um, definitely a deep end kind of yeah. situation for sure. It's sink or swim, trial by fire. Uh, but yeah, uh, still, so. you know, um, but that's the way to do it. You know, uh, I agree. Find, find a mentor. You know, find someone uh, who you really like and spend time with them. Try to hang around. Try to try to do work with them, uh, and just just do stuff. You know, because that's how you'll get known and how you'll get better. I totally agree. That was one thing, seeing all, like I've seen a ton of behind the scenes stuff with the Muppets because I'm a massive fan as well. Uh, it seemed like Jim Henson, Absolutely. Like, <laughs> his, dude, his sets seemed like the most collaborative like sets I've ever seen. It's so learning and what's going on. And like, like you said, you're learning on the job, but you're at the big leagues of the Muppets. Like, yeah, know. yeah. And it was also about having fun, though. I mean, it was very collaborative. Jim was definitely very open and collaborative and uh, would let people sort of find their way, find their place in it. You know, it, mm-hmm. it was it was if you were an individual personality, it wasn't that hard, provided you got on with everyone. Uh, it wasn't that hard for you to, to, to shine, you know, mm-hmm. but it was very collaborative and always very fun. You know, Jim always liked to, to play. 
uh, when he was able to get on set and play with puppets and with the technology and stuff like that. I, he was always very happy when he could do that, when he didn't have to, I think, do the business side of things and sure. and uh, goodness knows what else. You know, he, I think he was just he was at, at, at his happiest when he had a puppet on and he could just perform and play. And he just enjoyed that. You know, I don't think it was stressful for him, even when things were the schedule was tight and and, uh, you know, it was the clock was ticking we had 15 minutes left to do three scenes and they just instead of stopping tape and doing different takes they just keep the tape rolling and we just literally put a puppet on do that bit throw the puppet off put another one on to get the next bit i mean i've been in situations wow. uh, with, with jim and frank where that's had to happen before where they've had one day to do a whole bunch of of interstitials and link little scenes and stuff and you know there's always too much to do in a day and puppets always take a lot longer than humans Sure. And, you know, inevitably at the end of the day, everything got pushed, especially if you're sort of, you know, it's a new crew, new studio, new sets, and, and they had to light everything. And oh, boy. So oftentimes at the end of the day, you'd be pushed. And, and uh, but even then, Jim still, you know, kept it fun and, and, and the stuff still looked good. You know, it was quite quite an eye opener, let me say. So so that's the thing. So you sort of do also learn to really try and pull stuff out of the bag. Uh, almost on first rehearsal if you can if you even get a rehearsal i mean oftentimes we've shot so many things not just with muppets but even on my own uh, uh, other projects i've worked on and Mm -hmm. and in other independent things where there's not really even time to rehearse you just got to roll tape and try and get it in the first take so so the, the the earlier you can hit something and that's just where experience comes in. You know, you might not get the most creative take or sure. or uh, or the most precise, but you know, if you can still deliver it and move on, then uh, then you know you're you're you're, you're pretty good. Sure. So so yeah, that's you know that's sort of where you want to get to, I guess, uh, if you need to. Sure. And, and that's sometimes where we have needed to. In, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Definitely. But then again, it's no different to to a live performer. You go on stage. That's uh, true. Very rarely do they rewind to say, oh, hang on, I messed it up, let's start over. I mean, it's a, you do see performers do that sometimes. Mm-hmm. But, or, you know, something technical goes horribly wrong. But normally, you know, it's a speeding train and you just got to keep going and laugh it up and think, okay, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect. It's not going to be perfect anyway, but let's just have fun with this. And if we're having fun, then the audience is having fun too. You know, people know it's live you know it's fine yeah so that's true that's true <laughs> how often did your arm go numb when you were starting not too bad actually again yeah. that's where the technique comes in i mean um very rarely did i have issues like that actually uh because I, usually you're not i mean you'd rarely be up there for more than two minutes at a time anyway oh, oftentimes okay. it's 30 seconds and stuff like that small chunks mm-hmm. so um, but that's why you have to kind of get your technique down and get your body in a good position because then your your arm is still relaxed while it's up in the air and right. not straining. Um, if you don't know what you're doing, then you're going to be straining or if you're in a bad position because you're reaching through a hole or something or, you're, you know, then that, that's kind of unfortunate. You're, you know, you can't do much about that. But normally if you can get into a good position underneath and you sort of get that that center of gravity going through your body, and you can relax your arm and your shoulder. You can still perform and, and you know, do five minutes, ten minutes sometimes if you're really, you know, if the arm is woken up, sometimes you just got to get, get it woken up first to get the blood pumping around and everything. But, you know, sure. like so after you've done a take or two. Um, but there have been things, you know, some puppets are a little harder physically on, on the arm uh, if the mouths are a bit stiffer or they're just heavier or if they're, they're front heavy and things like that. Um, you know that can that can uh, affect things a lot. Um, sure. <clears throat> I think the biggest, uh, the, the only time that really sticks out in my mind of sort of going numb was uh, in my Skeksis on the Dark Crystal. There was one oh. scene where we came out uh, to look at the crystal bats in the in the crystal chamber there, and they, they were all looking up and were sort of watching it on the projected onto the crystal. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think I was in there about four hours uh, at that i think that was the longest i was in him and your arm is kind of locked in place into the into the neck of the thing you know right so you can't sort of drop your arm at all so i i remember my thumb going numb and and um, my shoulder getting a bit weird after four hours <laughs> so so the the head of the skexes little... is controlled by your hand yeah yeah it was yeah it was still a oh. hand puppet you know that was that was a, a gym thing always trying to get the hand into that head as much as possible 
Yeah, because gotcha. you just would never get that with mechanisms and stuff. Even to this day, it's still not the same. Sure. You know, put your hand in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just just make it work. That's it's right. so much better and so much easier. Sure. So it was still essentially a hand puppet with a flapping mouth. And then we just had cable mechanisms for the sneers and the and the brows and, and uh, uh, eye turns and blinks. So. Ah, I did not know that. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, the first three yeah. movies are Muppets, Dark Crystal, and Star Wars. <clears throat> Like, that is a yeah. hell of a start. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, after that, Fraggle Rock. So yeah. I would say it was downhill from now. <laughs> yeah. I was a has-been at, at 17 years old. But uh... <laughs> Yeesh, So when you, get on to, when you get on to Return of the Jedi, I mean, Star Wars had already become the phenomenon <laughs> that it is. And then you get <laughs> to be, <laughs> dude. What, what, so what was that like to go from a Henson set to what would have been a Richard Marquand set at that time? Yeah, yeah, and George Lucas very much. He was oh, still good, very good, much good. He was on, on set. Cool, yeah, cool. Yeah, definitely. I mean, he actually, um, uh, uh, he directed the uh, cockpit scenes with with Nine Number. Oh, and, uh, what? And and Billy D. Uh, it's not really been documented, but um, that was toward the end of the film, and they were getting a bit behind. So Richard Marquand was on another stage directing the Rancor pit uh, scenes. Gotcha. So George actually covered covered these these scenes. So what? I'm sure Richard, you know, looked in on it and and said yes, yes, whatever. But yeah, um, I never really saw him during those scenes myself. Uh, you know, I was only aware that George was around the whole time for that stuff. So. Um, yeah, yeah, but but yes, your question. Um, you know, stepping into this this uh, world, this being a fan uh, of Star Wars myself, of course, and especially uh, you know Yoda and Empire Strikes Back, you know, which was uh, definitely an obsession for me. Yeah. Um, so so walking into that, you know, it wasn't it wasn't Hansons, it wasn't Muppets, it was definitely a, it was a human film that had you know effects in it creatures and animatronics um and they weren't as advanced uh, it was a bit a bit like sort of going back in time because they just weren't technically as advanced as as what we were just using on the dark crystal sure um you know uh so things were heavier and and sort of stiffer and and that kind of thing some of the materials weren't as good as flexible so <clears throat> yeah it was it was it was certainly a different situation but but to, to to walk into the third, you know, the conclusion of that trilogy, uh, you know, and see all these guys in character and new makeups and all kinds of things was really um, very very exciting and and uh, and uh, humbling and and amazing, you know. Um, but I couldn't have done all the different characters and puppets that I did in that film had it not been for for the Dark Crystal. Sure, sure. It built you know, up, built I, up your was, technique. Yeah, it was just, yeah. Wow. Well, absolutely. And then how to how to do, uh, you know, animatronic faces or or a little realistic creatures, you know, like a baby Ewok and, and yeah. things, little tiny stuff like that. Um, you know, the the Ruiz hand puppet. Um, uh, that was an animatronic. Sure. Like hand puppet. You were all over that movie. Um, all kinds of things. Yeah, yeah, and helping with Snoodles and Akmar and um, yeah, gosh, uh, yeah. Dude. So so uh, so it was it was really fun there. It was amazing. It was it was it was uh, just a uh, yeah a, a fantastic fantastic experience. And and you know Star Wars itself, just to talk about that specifically, is something that that seems to find a way to to keep giving back to me somehow. You know, it keeps sure. coming back. You know, at the time it was another film. Okay, that's done. Move on. You know, we didn't have the social media stuff then, and the internet or anything like that. Mm -hmm. You know, you were kind of working in a black hole, and then you, you know, it said, okay, great, and off you go on to the next thing. So things kind of got quiet in the Star Wars world for quite a while, but then it just kind of kept coming back and kept coming back. So uh, you know, now there's the whole nostalgia thing with the original trilogy, which is really nice. I really enjoy that. Yeah, you know, it's become really important to people now at one point it was just old news you know so it's really <laughs> funny how stuff comes around <clears throat> yeah, and you know the man. prequels kind of helped with that a little bit as well absolutely but, but even uh, even since then you know that 30 year mark kind of hits and something changes it seems so it's it's great you know it's 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 really gratifying and it's, it's something that I, I never take for granted at all I, I really do enjoy it as a fan you know as well that's the thing I, I sort of I see it from from that side as well I appreciate the characters and the movies and and the worlds, you know, I, I enjoy that and uh, I enjoy watching that just as a as a as a fan. Sure, sure. So I've always wondered how did Nine Numbs talking work? Like, how did that puppet operate? 
Yeah, um, it almost didn't. You oh. know, that's the thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, because it wasn't a puppet originally. They, they had um, uh, there were two two uh, masks, and they weren't. They were kind of like a, a polyurethane or, or some kind of thick, thick, uh, nasty foam with sort of a latex covering on the skin. So it looked great, and mm-hmm. it sort of had its own sort of bodies. You know, they didn't have to sort of to uh, pat it out, but it wasn't like a nice fine sort of foam like you would have seen on Yoda or something like that, you know. So right. so it was a sort of big, it was essentially kind of like a big latex mask, but with sort of thick foam underneath it that was all part of the same mold, you know. I think they used al- aluminum or aluminium, as we would say, molds, I think, to cast that stuff in back then, oh. um, which helped them create this, the skin on the outside. So it made them very durable, but it also made them very stiff. And so, so Nine Numb originally was was just a background alien uh, with no articulation in the face at all. He was really? worn by an extra. Uh, yeah, and he he was he didn't have a name. He was I still have the lit the sheet somewhere here. Um, he was number nine on the on the uh, the, the creature list oh, essentially. That makes sense. <laughs> so yeah, so so that's how he became Nine Numb. So he was really a, a background alien, and then about halfway through the film. Um, you know, I was up in uh, uh, Phil Tippett's uh, workshop at Elstree, uh, falling around with creatures and mm-hmm. annoying them and hanging out <laughs> as one <laughs> as you do <laughs> would do at 17 years old. And uh, and he, you know, he, then he mentioned, oh, this guy George wants him now to he he liked the look of him and he wants him to be a, a character with with Lando and the Falcon. Oh. You know, I guess they realized that that they couldn't use Chewie and they needed someone else. So so George liked the look of him and said, so, you know, can we use this guy? Um, and it was coming up, you know, in like, I don't know, three or four weeks or something like that. <clears throat> and he was telling me about that. And he said, but, you know, he's going to have dialogue, but he doesn't have any movement uh, in his face. And I don't know what we're going to do. Maybe we'll sort of put a uh, like a, an oxygen mask over his mouth because it doesn't work. And maybe some bladders in his his cheeks. And, uh, and you know, and then an actor can wear it and it'll look like he's talking. Mm-hmm. And I remember thinking, ah, that's not acceptable. That's not very good. <laughs> so I, I picked up one of the masks and put my hand in it and showed him. It's like, so I worked it as a hand puppet and said, you could move this mouth as a hand puppet if you just kind of, you know, put a, a foam brain in here and, and uh, maybe, you know, add some, mechanize some eye blinks in here. It could work as, a, as like, just like a big Muppet, essentially. And he thought, oh, that's really interesting. He said, you know what, why don't you take one of these masks and, and cut it out and, uh, and fit it out inside and we'll we'll show it to George. So um, so I did that. About a week later, uh, we did a film test uh, f- uh, that George directed, and um, uh, the the extra was in in the other mask, and then I puppeted the the hand puppet version. And we were literally next to each other, and uh, we did a film test side by side. And George, you know, was telling us to look around and react to things and all that. Mm-hmm. And he liked what he saw. Oh, I think also during that point, I put my hand up behind his ear and wiggled his ears. And George <laughs> liked that as well. <clears throat> so he basically asked Stuart Ziff, uh, who was one of the coordinators for ILM, hey, you know, can you can you put blinks in it and make his ears wiggle and have it ready uh, in, uh, for two weeks? And he said, yeah, sure. <laughs> so so basically, I kind of got myself the job just by by being there and, and suggesting that stuff. Um, and so they flew it off to back to California and mechanized the, the head and it came back and we, we filmed on it. Uh, yeah, literally about two weeks or so later, I think. So, so, so yeah, it was essentially wow. a large Muppet and I had my hand inside his, I'm left-handed. So my left hand was inside the head. Mm-hmm. Um, Tim Rose and Simon Williamson were on the cable controls for his eyes and ears uh, behind and uh, his left hand was staffed and sort of just wire rigged onto the the steering yoke in the falcon they had to cut out the base of the seat of the of the falcon for me to lay flat in and get out of the out of the way enough right and they didn't want to do that because that was a uh, actually a, a like a red 1973 racing car seat apparently so they were like are you sure you want to do this like yeah, yeah i have to sorry <laughs> So um, they, you know, put some foam down on there and furniture pads and stuff. And, and I had a, you know, I was mic'd up with a microphone and a little uh, six inch black and white monitor so I could see what the camera saw uh-huh. and worked in Muppet style, which is why he has the, uh, the Muppet nod when he laughs. Uh, yes. There, uh, <laughs> when the, you know, when the Death Star blows up and stuff. So, Dude, that, that's <laughs> yeah. crazy. So you also like had a hand in basically building him. 
Wow. Uh, yeah, yeah, at least establishing. Yeah, I mean, I think all my fi- fixtures inside the mouth were the same. Yeah, sure. You know, and they just added mechanisms into the into the brain part, and they added a lot of weight to the to the head, um, so it was really really heavy. But that was also good because it sort of kept him a bit more grounded and made him look less sort of lightweight and puppety in a way, which is probably why a lot of people say I didn't realize it was a puppet. I thought it was a guy in a mask, you know. Right. Um, because he didn't move quite, you know, he wasn't too muppety, I guess. I mean, when you know that, you can sort of see it. But, sure. but uh, you know, it's it's good that most people don't think it's a hand puppet, you know. It's true. I didn't know I it was think, a hand okay, puppet Okay, well, that's a compliment. Recently. Again, though, you know that was that was what Jim was all about: was keeping the hand in there as much as possible, keeping the soul inside that head and that neck. And you sort of can't beat it, really. You know, there there are some great mechanisms around, but still, rarely do they ha- can they work with that those kinetics and dynamics that that a human arm and hand can do. You know, it's, it's still hard to replicate that even to this day. Sure. And the technology certainly wasn't around back then to to work him in that fashion as as a mask, as an animatronic mask. It just wasn't there. So Right, right. I, I like to look at <coughs> yeah. things that uh I like to look at things in context of the movie. And Nine Numb yeah. is one of my favorite aliens. But the fact that you got to co pilot the Millennium Falcon and blow up the second Death Star <laughs> with Lando Calrissian, like how do you how do you handle that? Because I'd be freaking out all the time. You know? <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> it's movie history you're a part uh, of. W- yeah, I mean, well, you know, you have to just get on with it, right? I yeah. Mean, you know, <laughs> one little part of you is like being the geeky fan. and Oh, my God, this is so cool. This is so cool. This is fantastic. And you're, you know, freaking out inside. But then you have to also put on your professional hat and say, oh, okay, yeah, just another day at the office. Yeah, you know? that's fine. <laughs> so, you get inside of and, him. <laughs> you know, and, and that really doesn't change even, you know, nearly 40 years on now. It's, it's, uh, it would be like my 19th year I'm I mean, I think now or something like that. Uh, sorry, nineteenth, uh, thirty ninth year that I'm I've been doing this now. Yeah. So um, uh, it doesn't change. You know, there's still one part of me that's that's like, you know, oh, this is great. Look, you know, I get to do this this cool stuff with these wonderful singers or actors or whatever, or these great scenes and sets and characters. You know, it, it, that that never gets old. But then, you know, you still just gotta gotta uh, be professional and, and get on with the job. So. Sure. Uh, that that hasn't changed. <laughs> I I also love that like like you're saying there's puppetry and then I know after that you did Fraggle Rock and then yeah. you fast forward a little bit to the 90s and you got into animation and worked on some pretty cool stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, that well that's right. Yeah, uh, Toy Story came along. Yeah, and uh, you know that was sort of a, a game changer uh, very much for the industry and I sort of saw what Pixar were doing as, as sort of the they were the animation equivalent of of Henson's to me at that time. You know, Absolutely. they had these these characters and these stories that were very engaging. Uh, but it was a new medium, you know, new technology. And I'd been sort of studying animation uh, on my own at home and on on little projects. Uh, I had some early early Macs that I was feeding video into and and doing morphing on and to make a puppet blink and things like that and painting out arm rods. So this would be, um, let's see, when was this? Mid-90s, I guess, somewhere around there. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, 95-ish, something like that, 96. Um, so I was looking into all that uh, sort of and, and playing around with the idea of some virtual puppetry stuff as well and and that kind of thing. I knew that it was it was a new tool that that um, that, that could be used, you know, so I, I'd go to all the, uh, the the computer trade shows and graphics trade shows in London that were happening at the time, and and it, it sort of got to the point where um, I basically got myself recruited at a show, and oh. uh, uh, Pixar came came. I was I think I I'd handed in some some stuff to the Pixar booth, and then I went off to a digital domain talk or something, uh, you know, uh, about whatever. And then uh, Ed Catmull and Pixar kind of came running after me because they're like, oh, we got to get this guy. Because at that time, there were no uh, schools to learn computer character animation. This was 96. Oh. Um, they, they, again, they didn't exist. Everything was cell animation at that time. Right. And so so Pixar's uh, concept at that point was um, – you know, we we can we can teach uh, people to to use our computers and our software, but we can't necessarily teach people to act. Whereas people like myself 
you know, already knew the performance and acting side of things and how to, how to, you know, bring these living cartoons to life. So theoretically it was, it was a less of a stretch to teach people like me to, to uh, just use the, you know, the animation tools basically. So, so they uh, kind of, kind of came running after me and, and uh, I had still had my puppet company at that time. And and the three of us went over to uh, Pixar and and gave a, a puppet talk to, uh, to the guys there, John Laster and, and Ed Catmull and Steve Jobs and everyone. And, uh, yeah. yeah, so they sort of got to know us a bit better. We, we brought a trunk of puppets and animatronics along and, and gave them a talk on their lawn one day. And, uh, and then, yeah, eventually, um, about, um, I think, I guess it was probably the, uh, the, the very end of, of, uh, 96, they said, yeah, you know, you want to come out and work for us. We've got two films we need to do, which of course was Toy Story 2 and a bug's life and yeah. uh so essentially at the beginning of 97 uh, i i basically moved out well i didn't move out there yet there was a 12 week uh they had um i think it was 12 weeks or eight weeks or something um uh they had pixar university that they had on their campus and mm-hmm. it was essentially a, a little class of of i don't know 10 or so of us <clears throat> to learn um you know to just to just go through learning the software and do little tests and stuff and if you passed if you graduated then you got to work on the film you know and i think all of us did graduate and we had a little graduation party and and then they then they said okay we're going to move you out now so i had like a week to go back home and pack everything up and sell and uh everything went out over in shipping containers and and uh they they moved me over to the states basically and that was it so that's kind of how that worked wow (laughs) That's crazy. Well, another thing that's crazy is you worked on one of my favorite movies <laughs> ever in Who Framed Roger Rabbit before this. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Again, how, um, this seems puppetry. like the most difficult yeah. set ever because it's animation and physical puppetry as well. Like how sort how, of. Did, the, how did that um, work? Because I know you're in this. There's that famous <clears throat> shot of you in Bob Hoskins' coat, which is just great. Mm. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like what 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 was it like it's, working it's on wild, that set? It? Yeah, dude. Talk to me. Talk to me. That was great. I mean, we got to do all kinds of crazy things. There's a lot of rods and a lot of strings and some hands-on stuff. I was sort of their main hand puppeteer. So um, so while I would still work guns on rods and, and, and other bits and pieces like that all over the place and, and like under the, underneath the bed, pulling parts of the bed when Roger Rabbit's jumping up and down on it, things like I was underneath pulling pulling oh, the part, really? little uh, controls under the bed. So we had all those kinds of things to do. Uh-huh. But but um, being their main hand puppeteer as well, there were a couple of shots where, you know, I'd have to put this grey glove on that they could then uh, uh, render stuff and rotoscope over. Um, and uh, I would sort of uh, sort of go into the hand puppeteer pose and, and do some weasels. Uh, two shots that are in the film, I remember, are um, uh, there's, there's a weasel that uh, has a bar of soap in its mouth and is spitting bubbles. Yes, so that was actually me with a, you know, working like a, like it's a hand puppet with the, with the, the, the soap in the mouth, and they drew the weasel over my hand. So that's me actually kind really? of puppeteering an invisible weasel essentially, and um, and the same thing goes for when Judge Doom throws the record across the bar and it, it gets stuck in a weasel's mouth and he's looking around with it in his mouth. Uh-huh. That was me working it as a hand puppet. Oh wow. So uh, yeah, and the animators basically had to to draw over my hand and match my movements frame by frame. So, um, and then we did things like the octopus bartender and the penguin waiters and yeah. and uh, things like that. So essentially, we sort of had to work very very closely with not only the animation department but but also with ILM. So uh, for ILM, we we, we sort of worked uh, closely with Ken Ralston, uh, who was sort of their ILM, you know. Uh, at the time, of course, Bob Zemex is sort of main guy for all his his effects, essentially yeah. Forrest Gump and all those things. And then for the Disney side of things, the animation side of things, uh, Don Hahn. Uh, so so those guys were on set the whole time. Wow. Uh, you know, Don Hahn went on to direct uh, uh, The Hunchback of Notre Dame and things yeah. like that. You know, so so two great guys. Uh, and then you know, once in a while, Richard Williams, of course, would be around. So we'd we'd uh, talk with him about stuff as well there was a shot that um we filmed and it didn't make it into the final movie but um it's at the bar again and roger rabbit picks up the notepad there was a character who was um who had a notepad around his neck um Uh i think they just called him deaf mute or something in the script or whatever but but roger picks up that notepad and a pencil and um draws 
um, a, a frame on there and then turns the page, draws another one, turns the page, yeah. and it gets quicker and quicker until it becomes an animation sequence. And so I was Roger Rabbit's hand doing the actual. It was just my hand basically doing the doing the oh, drawing. What? And um, and yeah, they were going to uh, you know have him sort of do a little real time animation, uh, but it never made it into the final film. I don't know how far they got with it to be honest, but sure. And then there were other times like when um, uh, Bob Hoskins comes back from Toontown, and he comes back with the pig head on him. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, there was a, a cut scene that they never, uh, either never finished or certainly never used, where he's sort of he's washing the pig head off, and then his hand sort of reaches out from behind the shower curtain, and he's fumbling for the towel, uh-huh. and Jessica hands him the towel, <laughs> uh. <laughs> uh, which was of course not in the final film, yeah. um, but that was kind of cool. Uh, um, you know, you just find it outside in his office. Um, but that was me handing him the towel as well, so I was Jessica's uh, <laughs> hands for that for that one shot as well. So the, all those different things, yeah. But it was really great being around someone like Bob Zemeckis, who was just so amazing. I mean, really, 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 really good, uh, you know, because he he had so much to contend with. The, the you know the, the the story side, he was involved in the story and the script, um, but also you know dealing with all the actors but then all the technical stuff as well i mean it must have been a such a huge nightmare for him and you know, the whole film had to be shot twice anyway because everything was was done on these uh, motion control uh, robotic uh, tracks and cameras and everything right uh plus you know they weren't just regular film cameras they were uh, they were uh, modified uh uh, Vista Vision cameras, I think they were, which basically the the frame frame was twice the size of a regular frame. Oh. Uh, so they they yeah, so they're called instead of por- four perf uh, perforations, they were eight perf. Wow. Um, and they were used in things like Gone with the Wind. They, so they actually bought cameras that were used in Gone with the Wind and modified them. Uh, and the, the film goes through the camera sideways, so it's, I think it's called a lazy eight oh. for the eight perfs. Uh, so what they, what they gave them was a larger negative for all the um, optical processing that they'd have to do with all the different layers, you know, in post. Otherwise, it would be too grainy. Right, um, okay. So so every shot, basically, that had anything remotely to do with any tune stuff, um, you know, we did background plates, essentially, uh, without any anything in there, um, uh, without anyone in there. So they would have some clean plates to... to uh, 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 to, 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 to render to and, and that kind of thing. So there's a one. So in other words, every every shot in the film was was shot with the actors in it, and then it was also shot without the actors in it, with you know uh, computers reproducing the, the camera movements. Sure, that is so. Nuts. Yeah. So man, talk about Bob the difficulty great, though, I mean, that, You know, <laughs> it was insane. I mean, it must have been so expensive to make, and um, and the stress levels for those guys must have been horrendous. You know. Um, sure. But, uh, uh, yeah, but, uh, and I think at that point, uh, Bob hadn't made Back to the Future 2 and 3 yet. He was going to, that was his next project, right after Roger Rabbit. Uh-huh. So, uh, yeah, amazing, isn't it, to think of that at that time. Crazy. I love those kind of yeah. movies that have, it, like, Space Jam. Anything that's live yeah, action right? and cartoon, it's just cool. It's a, it's a neat yeah. idea. Yeah, they, they didn't do as much interaction and things like Space Jam. I think they had it much easier, to be honest. Oh, absolutely. Than we did. <laughs> that was Absolutely. a bit later, and they, yeah, they didn't go anywhere near as far. Yeah, because they saw how difficult it was. <laughs> They're like, what did we need to do like, to oh, make a weasel? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. So, but we worked under the, um, actually under the George Gibbs uh, visual effects uh, department, essentially. So we were sort of working under him, and of course, he ended up winning the uh, Oscar for for that that year for best visual effects, Rightfully which was so. rather nice. Rightfully so. so. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so we helped him get that. There you go. There you go. I I I'd say the same. <laughs> oh yeah. No, we did. We did. Yep. yep. It's a, it's a hand in hand <laughs> thing here. Uh, oh yeah. And, and then uh, actually, that's a good pun, <laughs> isn't it? Hand in hand. I gotta we hand go. it to you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you had a hand in that win. Uh, so. Yeah. Absolutely. Just yeah. All two. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. At times. Uh, but <laughs> and, correct me if I'm wrong. Did you? Uh, work on animation on episode two, is that true? Episode two uh, of episode uh, Star Wars: Attack of the Clones. Of, yes, uh, Attack of the Clones. Yeah, what? I did. Um, yeah, after I left Pixar, um, let's see, I was a, I was at uh, Wild Brain for a few months. I, I animated on some Hershey's Kisses commercials. Oh, sweet. And then, but that was just sort of killing time until um, 
uh, episode two was cranking up. And the reason I wanted to do that was to because I knew they were going CG for Yoda right. uh, for the first time. And it's like, OK, hey, if these guys you know, don't don't sort of connect up the dots, it's not going to be quite right. So so I sort of made it my mission to, to go to ILM because I wanted to work on Yoda and, and, and help with the continuity of, of his his um, movement and that kind of thing, because I doubled up a lot for Frank Oz with with Fozzie and other uh, things of his characters. And I knew how he worked his arm and, and bones and muscles to, to get his characters to move the way that in his style that they do. And I knew I knew why Yoda moved the way he did um, with right. what was happening inside the head and that kind of thing and Frank's style. So I wanted to be a part of that to make him the same as the puppet. Mm-hmm. So that's why I went there. So I went through ILM's. I got about halfway through ILM's training. I think it was supposed to be a month and I got about halfway th- uh, two weeks into it or something. And then I got pulled out to uh, – they, they, were, they were a man down on uh, Jurassic Park 3. Yes. And so I got pulled out of that and ended up working on that for six months, uh, which was great. But then by the time that was finished and I went back on to uh, episode two, uh, Yoda was already underway, you know, and they just didn't really want to want me to come in and, and uh, mess things up for them and change stuff. So I didn't I wasn't really able to influence Yoda in any way. And that that frustrated me. Um, sure. So I finished I finished that film. My, my year was up and they asked me if I wanted to stay on and work on uh, Ang Lee's The Hulk. And I, and I thought that's just like, you know, digital sort of stunt stuff. It's not really character acting stuff it's not it's not me and i just thought well there's other people here that could use that job so i i decided to to move on you know sure that makes sense so, makes sense and yeah so, so then what was fast forwarding a bit uh so then what was it like getting the call that nine numb was going to come back yeah um well the thing is uh it it was it was something that i was i was anticipating and hoping for uh, i i knew you know that obviously that there was the new uh, new movie uh, coming up that was going to be made and that jj was going to be directing it and i thought well this is you know this is a, i knew it was a con- continuation of the story mm-hmm. and i thought well theoretically my character could still be around in some form in there so yeah so i actually actively set about to um to make sure they knew i was still alive and around yeah. and willing and, <laughs> and able you know it's like because it's easy to get forgotten they just assume you're dead or yeah. <laughs> or uh, you're too old or something it's like no 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 so <laughs> so what i did was um i actually built a little web page uh with uh, a letter on there and information of what i have done and and still am doing and and could do for the movie uh so it was sort of like a pitch a pitch website essentially sure uh, for jj and um uh, a, a friend of mine um uh, thomas dolby who uh was a, a, a well he is still a musician but he was known in the 80s for doing she blinded me with science oh right, right. um yeah so he actually it, it, we just finished up a music video a few years before uh, together it was his first music video in 19 years and i did all the puppets for that wow. and we worked together on a muppet thing in 1989 so so we, we sort of kept up with each other but it turns out that you know he was uh good friends with jj abrams so uh so i asked him basically hey can you just um uh link him this uh page for me and he said sure no problem and uh you know and then after a while like, yeah i've got a call um so i don't know if that if that did it or if that at least helped or if I would have been called anyway, because it seems as though uh, JJ and Kathleen Kennedy were still wanting to bring in these legacy characters and also um, to bring in the original performers like Tim Rose for Admiral Ackbar. Yes. So who knows? I may have, um, it may have been for nothing, but I don't, I don't know <laughs> to what extent, you know, my pitch, uh, you know, being proactive actually helped uh, or not. I'm really not sure. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting. So, so yeah, so what was it like? Well, when the call ca- finally came through, initially I didn't know what it was for. I thought it was for a puppet build for something else. Sure. Um, because they weren't allowed to tell me what it was. Of course. So it's of like, <laughs> okay, I'm interested. Uh, all right. You know, and I, I, didn't, I didn't catch on until a little bit late. So, oh, that's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> you know, until, you know, I think a second, a second call or, or, or email or something. It's like, all right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll do I this. Got it. And then I went over and, and had fittings. But it was a hard one because um, 
you know, it, I couldn't really tell anyone for two years. Uh, right. you know, it was like, this is so great, and I can't say anything for, for almost two years. It was crazy. Man. <laughs> so, what was, so being that you were a part of, like, the original build of the original Nine Numb, how much did yeah. the build of him now, like, how different is Nine Numb now, technically speaking? From before. Yeah, completely. I mean, he's much more advanced. Um, you know, I wasn't able to, to have any influence over over the look of him or anything like that because yeah, that had already been established before I came in for my fittings. Mm -hmm. But um, he was already sculpted and things like that. Sure. But um, however, uh, yeah, uh, um, you know, now he's he's like a nice, a really good foam skin, and uh, so and he's all sort of mechanized. Um, sort of outside of, you know, I wear a, I have a skull that fits me and then all the mechanisms are sort of bolted to that skull and then the, oh. the actual mask itself is bolted on top of that. So it's sort of a multi-layered thing and I look through his eyes now. So it's good because now I can see through him and I can be him and still try and get some of that continuity from some of that feeling from the original stuff. Um, but the, it's now con his face is now controlled by just one puppeteer externally by radio control. Um, and he can do the mouth for me and the, the, the facial stuff and all that kind of thing. So, it, you know, now I have legs. I can walk around and I can run around. There you go. Uh, which means I fall over a lot. But I can actually <laughs> get up there and, you know, interact with the performers and be part of part of the acting crew, you know, uh, be it running, walking or, or, or reacting or whatever. Um, so what's nice is uh, normally we'll, we'll rehearse, you know, with the heads off. And I can sort of get get a sense of um, what you know all the eye lines and 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 nail down my my timings on my reactions and my expressions, and I'll have my face person, um, face performer, you know, like watch what I'm doing, you know, uh, because this is my intent, and then I'll sort of tell them, you know, for this line, uh, you know, I'm going to do a, a, a sort of a, a concerned look, and I'm just going to hold that pose for a bit, or I'm going to do a you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be, I'm just gonna look down and shake my head at, the, at this point. So I'll try and nail down, you know, my performance. I'm pretty, pretty hard on my, on my face performers because I, I just know specifically <laughs> what I want. You know, it's like this is what I want here, and keep the eyes, you know, as wide as they, they can go here because that's his character. Don't make him too squinty and stuff like that. So I'm really very specific uh, with those guys. And then we have a, a two-way uh, talkback interaction. So I have an earpiece uh, inside, so I can hear what they're saying to me. And then quite often uh, I have a microphone too, so I can talk with them as well. So we have two-way communication. Critical for a lot of timings because I, my vis visibility usually goes to almost nothing after about two minutes in there because the eyes just fog up. You know, there's uh, so much heat and moisture. Yep. It's, it gets so hot inside there. And there's nothing – we've tried everything and there's nothing <laughs> we can really do. So, uh, so you know, they have to, just have to come in with, with cold air blowers in between takes when possible. Um, so it's – yeah, oftentimes I'm working blind. And going on uh, on instinct, which is you know, which explains the falling over and stuff. So, uh, <laughs> which which did happen, you know, on Force Awakens, I fell over onto BB-8 and broke his antenna, and they oh, had no. to glue them back on. And, it was you, yeah, all kinds. <laughs> yeah, it was it was me. So, but he moved into the wrong spot. It was his fault. That's right. What a diva. So, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, so, so yeah, so it's it's a totally different uh, process now. But I really, really just like. Uh, you know, being a, being a, a complete figure, you know, and uh, yeah. and just being able to to act with 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 all the the other performers and and uh, be be in there and part of it all. It's it's just been so amazing, and uh, it is fun now because you know now when I walk on set, you know, people are like, oh, it's that guy, you know, the, whether they're extras or or other parts of the crew or something, you know, they like that. Oh, I know who that guy is, and yeah, I used to love him in in you know the Return of the Jedi, and then they kind of get really surprised when I say, well, that was me then as well. They just assume I'm some new guy, you know? Sure. So, and so, yeah, that, yeah, I did him then too. And they're like, oh, no, they can't believe it. So it's very, very fun. It's it's really fun. I'm, I'm definitely going to miss him, uh, you know, when it's all over. Uh, I hope there'll be more of him somewhere along the way. Uh, Same. But uh, at least we get to enjoy him in the in the new uh, ride this year. In, yeah. In the theme parks. That's so, so. cool. So that's good. Yeah, it's going to be amazing. So at least he lives on uh, in the parks and, and the movies, and maybe sometime in the future, but who knows? I mean, I can. I would love that, yeah. Yeah, and also in my heart. 
but uh, yeah, also definitely in the toys and the comics and <laughs> yeah, he's a, he's around, you know, <laughs> he's a rebellion hero after all. <laughs> he is, he is. <laughs> but uh, I I want to talk about uh, the secret of puppetry school that I am oh, yeah. part of. Um, yes, dude, you are. Yeah, it's way harder than I expected. <laughs> okay. I was like, I yeah. Was like, I was like, this is going to be difficult because the technical aspect of learning to use your hand and hold it up correctly, like it's it's so cool. I'm absolutely loving it, but I'm also like oh, OCD about it. Where I'm like, I have to get this down before I move on, and I love how you yeah. broke it up. So I, okay, I, how did this come to be? Like, when are you like, I'm gonna I'm gonna give my secrets to a school? <laughs> yeah, I mean, well. Uh... Yeah, it's it, it's all technique. I mean, that's the thing. You know, the the school teaches technique more yep, than anything because sure. once you've got got technique down, then then you can sort of apply that to anything, uh, including animation. You know, my puppetry helped my animation, and then my animation helped my puppetry. So sure. you know, they're all connected, and and you know, dance and music as well. It's all the same thing. But um, uh, you know, Jim and and his guys were very very open about teaching uh the, the principles and the techniques uh you know and, and getting new blood and expanding that knowledge um and encouraging that you know they weren't they weren't into into keeping that stuff to themselves sure. so sort of it, so a lot of it sort of comes from there uh you know we had specifically a lot of uh puppetry workshops during uh dark crystal uh, pre-production and jim and frank and those guys would, oh. would uh, be a big part of that Mm-hmm. And I think I talk about one of those uh, uh, workshops in in the in the course there, uh, where we were trying to do walks um, in yes. the Dark Crystal workshop. So that was that was something that Jim specifically was teaching. So so a lot of the stuff sort of had its genesis, not only from what I'd learned myself and and learned along the way uh, uh, on the, all these these projects, but also from specific workshops as well. Well, that Jim Henson taught, and some of the other puppeteers taught, as Dave Gulls and Richard Hunt and those guys. So, um, so I sort of pulled it all together, and I, I think in the mid '90s, uh, my company uh, actually taught its very first uh, class uh, for a week at the uh, Little Angel Marionette Theatre in London, oh, which cool. was a little puppet theatre, and it was ten people. And uh, I made some little. They were like the the early versions of Quinnies, essentially for oh, this. There were ten ten puppets. Um, they look more like weasels because they didn't have any ears. And then they, rather than the floppy fingers, that you just sort of had these little ziggy zaggy claw things, you know. Yeah. Um, but essentially they were the same thing. And so that was that was sort of how that came about. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and I know a few of those have gone on to, to, to become established puppeteers. Uh, one of them I was just working with uh, last year. So uh, that was on that original course. Another one was... Um, uh, Pat Garrett, who uh, choreographed the, the Muppet Christmas Carol and King Ralph and a whole bunch of other things. So she was in that puppetry course, course as well. That's so cool. Um, yeah. See, so Yoda had an effect on you. So that's kind you. of where it started. <laughs> so pass on what you've yeah, learned. Yeah, absolutely. Man. Well, that's, that's the thing. You know, it, it gets to the point where it's like either you can just sort of jealously guard everything and keep it to yourself and, and, you know, try to grab all the jobs or you can realize that in fact, the more you give, the more you get back. Um, and I think that's definitely true. Uh, knowledge, knowledge should be shared. It shouldn't be kept, uh, whatever that knowledge is. It just doesn't make sense. You know, otherwise we're not going to grow, you know, we're not, I mean, Hey, you know, new blood is good. Uh, new, new ideas, new competition. And anyway, you know, if some of these new, new guys come along and do well, then they can give me a, Hey, you know, it's a win-win, right? That's right. That's <laughs> right. One hand washes the other, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. No, nah, so exactly. So, and there's there's room enough for everyone. We need more puppeteers, more 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 uh, characters, more puppet shows. So, so it has to be encouraged. Uh, you know, and, and 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 it needs to be fun no matter what. And I try to try to get that through in the in the academy a little bit that, you know, there is no race, there's no rush. Uh, just enjoy the process. Because it, it always because it's hard to do anyway. It should always be fun, whether you're you're doing it as a hobby or or semi professional or, or you want to sort of, sort of hit the big time with it um, and be the next big thing. It should always always be as much fun as possible uh, performing these things. Uh, otherwise, you know, it's What's time to quit. I think yeah. <laughs> if you're not having fun, because it is hard. It is you know it can be very hard physically and stuff like that. So, so I hope that comes through in the in the course at least that you know just have fun, enjoy the process. 
Absolutely. I to- I cannot recommend it enough. Like just oh, from the you. first from the very first thing cuz you broke it down. Like you even said, <laughs> you break it down into more manageable pieces and yeah. then it makes it more digestible. And I love how you've gone technique to this to this and like just after one video, I, I'm looking at my hand differently. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's yeah, exactly. How this is because when you know, and you know. You literally have to. Yeah, I mean, that was the thing I discovered when I did the very first live class. Was okay, you know, I can't assume anything. Let's assume you're you're day one and you just, you know, you, you you've never done this before. I have no clue. So then you, I started to think, okay, how do you break? You know, what's happening with the mechanics of the hand and the arm? And, uh, and why and that kind of thing and that stuff those kind of levels of details are things i've not ever really seen being taught anywhere else uh, at any point so uh I, yeah i tend to be quite thorough about about the details like that but i think it's also necessary as well to understand and to take the fear away and, and think oh, okay i get it now i get it now you know I so agree. for the people that want to get it for the people that want to 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 to, to be good at this and and to communicate you know, the character in a really clear and clean way. And, and I, I talk about that whole thing about keeping the performance minimalist and relaxed and clean, you know, clean performances, uh, very much animation style, almost pose to pose. I, I talk about that quite a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, in the, less is more. I, yeah. I think there's one lesson called less is more in there. Yep. <laughs> it's right, poignant. To teach about, you know, how do you just stand and do nothing and still keep it alive? You know, it's, it's, it's fun. It's good. I agree. I agree. You've shared what you've learned. You've also got great <laughs> stories to share because I want to talk about what's going on right now is you've got a Kickstarter for uh, yeah. for a, a memoir. Yeah, yeah. This is sort of a, 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 a something that's specifically for the, for the fans, um, sort of a, a limited uh, hardback uh, version. Uh, it's, it's being written at the moment. I outlined something years ago, but but yeah. uh, you know a lot of a lot of things have happened since then. So I sort of going over it from scratch and, and adding a lot more stuff. So this is sort of a, there'll be another version later that people can sort of, you know, buy from Amazon and goodness knows where and stuff. like Probably, you know, softbacks and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But I wanted this sort of to be a, a sort of a special, uh, a special launch, you know, where it's a, it's a nice quality book and everyone would, would be signed and people can tell me what they want to see in it and, and I can add that stuff in there. So it's something I'm trying, uh, you know, and it's a good way for me to make sure that I write this thing as well and finish it and get it sure. out there, you know, <laughs> because then I become accountable to everyone. It, it's very easy to say, oh, I'll wait till after episode nine and that'll be the perfect time. And, oh, I'll wait until you know, <laughs> this next thing. And, and it just, you know, it, it almost finishes and never, never quite does. So, so this is a good way to, to ensure that at least if it funds anyway, that, that, uh, you know, I actually get this book out here and, and, and it's something that hopefully the Muppet and Star Wars fans, uh, might, might enjoy, uh, you know, because I do have a lot of, uh, uh, uh experiences that, that, that just never get um, put into any of the books and things like that, you know, and people want to know, you know, how, how, how on earth did this happen? And what, what was your relationship with Jim and, and things like that, you know, and, and that stuff never gets told and all the, all the, the, the details and things. Sure. So you, they always interview the same five people, but, but uh, you know, what about us guys? So, you know, I worked with Jim for 10 years, so talked to him for at least three yeah. before then. So. <laughs> Hey, it worked, didn't it? So I have a lot, to, you know, <laughs> I want to share that information now and show people that, you know, we are all connected and, and that we can all do this and it's not something for the elite. And, and that was part of what Jim's message was as well, you know, that, that we're, we're all in this together, basically. So I sort of like connecting up the dots a lot uh, and not having it be a, a, a them and us kind of thing, but that we're all sort of in this, in this big, big, uh, this big place together. Uh, we all affect each other as well, you know. Totally Which is also agree. what I, I talk about the feedback loop quite often. Um, and so, for example, I just mentioned the book. People can tell me what they want to see in the book, and I'll add that stuff. Uh, which is great. And the same thing goes for, um, you know, now that I've been doing conventions and shows, uh, signing autographs and things like that, the fans come to the tables and they tell me, you know, something that they really enjoy and like. And after a few people, I think, oh, this is a thing. I didn't know this was a thing. I'll make sure that I try and get that into the character, you know, on the next one and things like that. So it, it actually, it makes it much more of a, 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 a cycle, you know. It's not just a, a brick wall anymore. It's, it's, a, it's a conversation, essentially, uh, that, that, you know, the performers and the creators and filmmakers put out to the world, but then the world also 
feeds back into that process again, um, which is, is a new thing. That's a recent thing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we didn't have social media before now, so it's like you said, you were kind of making these movies in a vacuum, and then you absolutely. put them out, and that's it. Whereas now it's it's more yeah. collaborative. Like, it's just everyone all a part of this thing. Mm-hmm. I, I like the way you put that. Well, yeah, nice. so that's that's really interesting, and, and yeah, I mean, absolutely. So. So, I mean, not, you know, not that you want to sort of, you don't pander to some common denominator or anything like that. Although, of you course. Know, if that's what you set out to do, then uh, you should do that. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, uh, but nevertheless, you know, uh, it, what people tell me does affect what I do very much so. so. Sure. That's so cool. Can you believe we've been talking for over an hour already? No, no, no. Good. Uh, that's what I like to hear. <laughs> well, or I've been talking. Maybe I just go on and on too much. That's, usually, I talk a lot. Um, I love it. But, but yeah. So, so yeah. So my my book um, basically is is essentially trying to help connect up the dots a little bit and uh, go into some details that people otherwise might not hear, and maybe also you know helping to encourage a few others to to sort of go down a similar path if they want, or discourage them if they don't like uh, yeah. you know what I've been through <laughs> and what I'm going through. It's like, oh, I definitely don't want to do that. Save yeah. them some time. You know, it's like, yeah, right. <laughs> cut out the middleman. Just cut out, yeah, save, save yourself the next 40 years of pain and become a plumber or something. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, <laughs> Live vicariously through your book. <laughs> there you go. So they have a choice. They can either do that or they can use it too as a, as a roadmap and think, okay, maybe I could do this too, you know. Because basically when I started out, I was nothing special. I was, you know, I really – and I talk, I talk about, uh, I think, in the academy too, what is talent, you know. And I, yes. I really think talent is – isn't necessarily some natural gift from above necessarily it's just you know are you are you obsessed enough to to get good at it right right <laughs> so uh you know that's talent it's just a lot of hard work um and focus and uh you know making your opportunities as well absolutely uh, that's a big part of it uh and being persistent you know not giving up not giving up that's a big thing right now as well you know it's, it's easy to 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 give up too soon and think oh this is too hard and and oh, this will never happen, and get real, and that kind of thing. And and you know that's that's when things don't happen. You know, that's true. Um, uh, it's true. the ones that persist are the ones that do succeed, and that's just a fact. It's true. If you give up, you'll never know. That's no, just absolutely. how it's going to go. Absolutely. So so, and everyone has something different to bring to the table too. That's that's another important thing. You know, I uh, agree. Yeah, I I always get irritated when I when I see things about uh, people say, you know, oh, be the next Spielberg and be the next Lucas and be the next Hanson. It's like, no, 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 no. You you do not want to do that. You want to be the next you. You know. Yeah. Uh, that person's already done that. Uh, you know, we don't need them imitations and copies. Find your thing, find find your style and what makes you happy, and 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 bring that to the to the table. And I see that, especially on the smaller projects online now, which is really interesting. Yeah. Different styles of puppetry and and techniques and materials and uh, different stories to tell. You know, it's that that to me is really exciting. That's that's what gets me uh, makes me happy. Definitely is, is seeing what what um what what. Uh, individuals are doing and and putting out there and making happen uh, I agree. Uh, you know that's what did originally you know muppets were psychedelic and crazy and and, and hippie and all kinds of weird things back in the, yeah. in the 60s and <laughs> 70s uh you know he just went off and did his own thing and, and look what we got because of that so you know i want to see more of those things and i'm guilty of that myself it's something that i need to to actually try and spend more time on is is uh is uh, uh finding new uh materials and techniques and, and types of stories to tell uh, because there's always a place for that. There's always a demand for that. Um, if you can do good work and you know collaborate with with a, with your dream team, you know I always tell people to get their dream team together in a little core in a circle and create something, you know, and keep working at it. And chances are, if you stick with it, you'll actually come up with something great and something that people want to see. And it, you could even have somewhat of a career doing it too. So so that's sort of the next. You know that's the next level of things. It's it's one thing to learn a technique and to learn about the history and to and to know what's what's gone before and and how to do things now. But once you have that knowledge, you know, well, where do you take it next? What do you you know what do you, what do you want to do next? I mean, you know, that's how we got jazz. You know, they started out with with uh, you know melodies and rhythm, and and then they mixed it all up and, and came up with a new kind of music. So yeah, that's right. that's what we do. That's what we do. That's what we need to do, and encourage that and take take chances and take risks basically and then try stuff out experiment and not be afraid to fail people are afraid to fail and uh, when, when you can get past that it's like you know as, as the saying goes uh, you know fail forward essentially and enjoy it and not not worry about it not be perfect it's not going to be 
don't worry about it move on <laughs> i agree <laughs> just do stuff you know it gets it's better to do something and finish it and put it out there you know uh, even if it's not a big hit not everything needs to be hugely successful and, and you know a lot of things aren't but the minus uh you know have fun doing it and learn stuff and the chances are someone out there will really be inspired by it anyway if it's quality work yeah so, yeah that's sort of my my take on on how we move forward with with where we are now in in the in the in the world and in, in the, with the technology and and our knowledge i totally agree i totally agree and you all win any sort of creative endeavor like even if it doesn't go the way you planned it you still get experience from it you know so it's all it always all always a lot yeah i mean and and to be honest i mean a lot of it is a lot of it is learning what not to do yeah you know <laughs> I would say that's that's because I, I got into directing out of purely out of frustration working on these smaller projects and and I would just get so annoyed at the directors like why is this not a two shot why are you in this extreme right. close up and I've got no room <laughs> to move and I just get really irritated so so I learned what not to do you know yeah yeah which is just as <laughs> so good experience I think that's the, <laughs> you know yeah very much so very much <laughs> but where, so where can people find this book this book um well uh, right now a uh, Kickstarter. Um, Mike Quinn Talk to the Hand uh, if they put that in that should be pretty easy to, to find um, I think as of now we have just just, uh, just over 10 days I'm just doing a really short campaign mm-hmm. uh, you know I'm sure if I'd made it longer I would have uh, perhaps you know given more people a chance to get it but I it, these things just consume you so much I just yep. you know, it's like you know I have other things to do I just yeah. cannot, <laughs> cannot do a month or two month ca- long campaign uh, there's, there's so much else going on and so I thought, well, I'll give it a go, and uh, if it fully funds, and then then people get their, their their rewards. If it doesn't fully fund, I set a really low threshold mm-hmm. too. But if it doesn't fund, then I'll uh, regroup and, and find another way of, of of making it and putting it out there. But I figured, well, hey, it's worth worth a try. Yeah, um, why not? And so far, you know, there's there's uh, good good different rewards. It's a little bit cheaper if people just want to get, say, the you know, an ebook or a or um, an audio book, or, or I think I've got a deal where you can get the two, combination of the two, and, and instead of paying for the hardback and shipping. The books themselves are very expensive, and, of course, the lower the number of books that I print, the, the more it's going to cost me. So, yep. so and then the shipping, and especially international stuff, is is, uh, is humongous. I want to ship them in proper boxes, not envelopes and that kind of thing. So I kind of kept the shipping simple. Um, uh, you know, and that, it just adds to the cost a little bit, but... But I'm hoping that if I can, when I finally get a reality on, on how much everything does cost, then that uh, if if shipping is, if I've way overestimated on stuff finally, then uh, I'll be able to refund uh, the difference of of what everything costs to ship to people, maybe via PayPal or something. So that way, at least they get a little something back, um, you know. But yeah. uh, I tried to keep it really simple and just had shipping to the U.S. and the rest of the world instead of 20 different you know options, and it just gets really complicated. So oh, yeah. not not knowing all the details, so so I sort of I ballparked it, but but it does add add to the cost. But then again, you know they're getting something that's very limited and, and a first edition, and it's definitely a, a, a fan item. But but for the for the ones that can't afford the, the the actual physical book, then yeah, there's the digital downloads that are a lot cheaper as well. So uh, yeah, they can go on there and have a look and see if there's anything that uh, that that might work for them. But uh, we're I think when I last looked, we're just over a quarter past. Uh, Past the the funding goal now, right on, twenty six percent or something like that. After about three days, and there's yeah, like I say, there's just over ten to go. So who knows? Usually things things tr- uh, get quiet in the middle of the campaign, and then they kind of there's a mad frenzy at the end. So yeah. <laughs> everyone panics. <laughs> like oh no, there's only one day left, and then that's they, right. They they they, they pledge rewards. So so we'll see. We'll see. I mean, it's definitely worth a try. And I agree. It, it's it's good for me to uh, uh, to to take this seriously and, and find out. You know, get a feel the temperature of what people really want, and and uh, you know how much they want, and and to get me moving on it really. So it, sure. it's all good, basically. It's all good, whatever yeah, happens. Of course. And, and it's, if it doesn't fund, then I'll find another way to get to get the book out there. So you know, it's good. Exactly. You know, just just gotta keep keep, on keep pushing, moving. moving forward, moving upward, and 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 try stuff. You know, that's the thing. I agree. And always, always moving forward. <laughs> You're right. So for those who are interested. And learning the art of puppetry, where can they find the secrets of puppetry school? Oh, okay. Yes, that's a very good question. Well, they can either contact me directly and I can send them the link or they can go to uh, secretsofpuppetry.com yeah. um, or uh, 
academy uh, dot secrets of poetry dot com actually has the um, the, the main uh, uh, front pages on there. Um, so so yeah, the sites are actually held on academy dot secrets of poetry dot com, and they can they can log, uh, log in there and and see what's going on. But if they want a little more detail about what's actually inside the course and see samples, then they yes. just go to secrets of poetry dot com, and there'll be something will come up there that's got past um sales the, the sales have closed right now but it will it actually tells you a lot more about what's in the actual uh, class so mm-hmm. so uh there's there's two places they can go uh, but otherwise i'm easy to find on on social media so if, if they're lost they can just ping me and i'll i'll uh, help them out but uh, thank you yeah yeah it, 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 there, there are multiple levels but it's essentially the 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 the, the uh, uh initial level bronze uh, has actually uh, it's it's it goes from beginner to to intermediate to to a degree to advanced as well. There's actually a lot of stuff in there yeah. and plenty to get people uh, keep people busy for six months. I think so. I yeah. think it's a really good place to start, uh, even if they just want to sort of do it for fun uh, and get a look into that world. And you know, then it's still it's still great. So so thank you. Yeah. Yeah, of course. I just think it's amazing that you can learn puppetry from someone who's been doing it for so long on such a level. It's like, dude. Good. I, I think it's amazing. I, I really appreciate you doing that and sharing your knowledge and experience in a teaching Thank way. You. It's uh, it's pretty awesome. I'm a big fan. Well, you know, and it's good for me too because uh, oftentimes you don't really understand why you're doing things and what happens until you have to teach someone how to do it. <laughs> so it's, True. it's quite good for me to, to go through that process like, wait, why, why do I do this? And, you know, I never really thought about it before. Oh, that's why. So, yeah, you have a greater understanding for something when you have to teach it. Agreed. <laughs> I totally agree. So, what, most importantly, where can people find you online? Oh, let's see. Uh, I'm. Uh, let's see. They'll find me, uh, Mike Quinn, on uh, Facebook, and there'll usually be my face on there somewhere or 9num or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, I do have a Twitter account, but I tend not to, to, to nurture it that well. I think stuff just gets automatically posted to that. Mm-hmm. Um, Instagram, uh, Secrets of Puppetry, they can find me there. Mm-hmm. That's a good one as well. Um, and I, I think, am I forgetting anything? We don't have MySpace anymore, do we? No, no we got rid of that. <laughs> <laughs> so don't find me there then. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's a different Mike Quinn there. <laughs> you don't want to meet that guy. <laughs> uh, absolutely, yeah, the bodybuilder, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> People often get us confused, yeah. but there you go. I reached out to him is. first for the show, and he's like, what? I was like, oh, never mind. <laughs> Wrong yeah, Mike yeah, Quinn. <laughs> trying, to, trying to muscle in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man brilliant but dude this Thank was great you. this was really really fun <laughs> excellent excellent i hope hope that uh yeah people got something out of it and, and learned a few things at least and and it's always always fun to to talk about that stuff and find out what people want to know as well you know so yeah i agree, I agree. anytime you want to come back on to promote some things i got you man Great. Okay, I'll be back tomorrow then, and the day Perfect. after, and the day after that. I'll yep. just keep coming back every yeah. day. So. We're, yeah, we're actually here to announce you're my new co-host. Um. <laughs> oh, fantastic co-host! Yes. yes. Uh, whose name go? Whose name is first though? Let's just get uh, that straight. Let's go. Out. I mean, we're gonna have to go. You know, the old English alphabetical. So uh, okay. I don't make the rules, Mike. You know. <laughs> no, you don't. Exactly. I can always change my name. So That's, true. That. That's true. You know, what? if you did, I would give you the position. <laughs> There we are. I'll work on that. I'll get back to you. Yeah, Brilliant. exactly. Thank, yeah, thank you so much, though. It's very kind of you, and and uh, and you've been really great. And it's been it's been good good getting to know you, and yeah, and seeing you around in, in the in the membership area too, and stuff. So it's great because I can see how I can track how what percentage everyone's been through the lessons too. It's brilliant. Yeah, yeah, it's smart. <laughs> so you know, <laughs> I love it. This is great. And. <laughs> Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it is at Pod of Interest on Twitter. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian all over the place. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all Jedi Brian. If you enjoyed this episode, please share and tell your friends. 
let them know we got some cool stuff going on over here. Also, I've gone and made a Patreon. So if you'd like to support the show, you now have that option over at patreon.com slash Jedi Brian. On that note, special thanks to Chris, Ben, Jim, Daz, Kelly, and Daryl. Your support means everything, and I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well.